Good luck, everyone. Thank you. I'll start in one minute. Dear participants, warm greetings and welcome to this conference session, Holistic Approaches to Rural Women's Economic Empowerment. My name is Catherine McCarran and I am the JP Roo Global Coordinator for this programme. Um, we are delighted to be here with you today as part of this Cultivating Equality Conference on Gender Research in Agriculture and Food Systems. And thank you for participating and joining us um, from wherever you are today. We hope that you will enjoy the session and we welcome the opportunity for discussion following our presentation. So the joint programme, Accelerating Progress Towards the Economic Empowerment of Rural Women, or as we know it, the JPRU, is an initiative of four UN agencies, FAO, EFAD, WFP and UN Women. The programme was implemented from October 2014 until June 2021 in seven countries globally, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Kyrgyzstan, Liberia, Nepal, Niger and Rwanda. A second phase of this global programme is currently being designed based on the learnings to date. And the programme itself represents a unique partnership which capitalises on each participating UN agency's mandate, comparative advantage and institutional strengths to generate sustainable and broad scale improvements in the livelihoods and rights of rural women. The JP Roo aimed to attain four interrelated outcomes, improved food, nutrition and, and improved food security and nutrition, increased incomes to sustain livelihoods, enhanced participation in decision-making at community level and a more gender responsive policy environment. The programme reached over 80,000 beneficiaries and 400,000 household members through a comprehensive package of sequenced interventions. In addition, changes of behaviour and attitudes on discriminatory gender norms were achieved by addressing the underlying social norms that continue to undermine rural women's economic empowerment. The engagement of men through innovative methodologies, 
such as the Gender Action Learning System or Demetra Clubs, contributed to rethinking the roles of women and changing power dynamics at household and community level. So during today's session, we'll be hearing from gender specialists in FAO, EFAD, and UN Women about some of the results of the programme, along with an analysis from an assistant professor at the University of Milan. We will also be showing two short film clips from two of our implementing countries in order to showcase the story of transformation achieved at ground level and to hear the stories of rural women who have been empowered through the programme. So just before we begin, please can I ask that you keep your microphones muted and channel any questions or comments through the chat function at the bottom of your screens. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentations, and we welcome any questions that you may have for our speakers. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to Susan Callier, Senior Gender Officer at the Food and Agricultural Organization, who is going to share with us an overview of some of the key programme findings. Thank you, Susan, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Welcome uh, everyone, and it's my pleasure to share some of the lessons that have come from this program. Uh, I'll share my screen so that I can present. <clears throat> Sorry, you get to see everything. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Catherine has said, what we're going to do is share the JP Ruiz global evaluation, the results that came out and the key findings and some of the reflections. As Catherine has said, this is a joint program that's implemented by FAO, IFAD, UN Women and uh, WFP. And it's called Accelerating Progress Towards the Economic Empowerment of Rural Women. Uh, Catherine, I think, has already mentioned this. Uh, the program is implemented in seven countries and has to date reached 80,000 women and about 400,000 family members. And uh, it reaches women through four interrelated outcomes. Uh, the first one is on improved food, secu food security and nutrition. The second outcome is on increased income to sustain livelihoods. The third one is on enhanced participation in decision making. And the last one is on more gender responsive policy environments. So what we did is we, we conducted an external evaluation, uh, really trying to look at what had worked, what had not worked and what lessons could we use going forward into the phase two of the program. We hired uh, an external evaluation called Mukoro, and they are the ones that carried out the evaluation, which involved a mix of primary data collection, secondary data collection at the global level, at the country level. <clears throat> and what they did is in, involved a lot of in-depth in document review. We had a global and national stakeholder interviews. There was an online survey. And then they did three in-country in-depth case studies in Niger, Guatemala, and Nepal. And then they did desk studies in Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan, Liberia, Rwanda. And for each of the countries, there was also validation workshops carried out. So several things came out. The first one is uh, the evaluation really confirmed that we had, the program had targeted women in the greatest need uh, in, and people also living in food insecure areas and uh, really ensuring the principle of leave no one behind. So we work with indigenous women in Guatemala, pastoralist women in Ethiopia, socially marginalized or groups living with uh, HIV AIDS and uh, survivors of gender-based violence in Rwanda amongst others. But we also targeted both very vulnerable women, but also women with potential for agribusiness development so that we could encourage um, a mentoring approach uh, across the women. Um, so what were the program strategies and approaches? Several things come out. The first one is, as I mentioned, an integrated <laughs> approach uh, that allowed us to intervene at multiple dimensions, uh, because recognizing that women face multiple disadvantages. 
So that was really crucial, you know, intervening in terms of food security, in terms of income, but making sure you're building leadership, women's participation in, in organizations amongst others. The program used a participatory process to make sure that we were listening to the women and there was a bottom up approach going on. A big focus on addressing the root causes of gender inequalities, so looking at gender transformative approaches, and I'll talk about that. We recognize that capacity development was key to achieving the kind of, of uh, impacts that were required and recognize that the entry point of using the group as an entry point was extremely crucial. And the program really focused on building partnerships with civil society, with government, between government and communities, but also between the four agencies that are implementing. So in terms of the kinds of results that we've, uh, we got, let me start with the first outcome in terms of improved food security and nutrition. The first thing to note was that uh, we really focused on making sure that healthy nutrition status was a foundation and recognizing that this was important for building empowerment. Um, there was several, several activities. Uh, there was access to nutrition services and training, and this really helped to improve household nutrition. Um, the program also provided inputs in the form of livestock, uh, but also women were able to buy livestock uh, using their, their savings and their credit. The livestock was hugely important in terms of providing manure that increased yields, uh, vegetables or uh, more vegetable production, and of course, livestock production, which was being sold. <clears throat> women adopted various improved production technologies leading to increases in productivity. And how did we, how did this, how was this uh, demonstrated? The diets improved from uh, eating uh, livestock, poultry, the eggs and the meat, but also there were homegrown kitchen gardens. So there was a huge improvement in terms of diet. The improvements in nutrition and in diet meant that there was less expenditure on health services, that therefore there was more disposable income that the households and the women could use to purchase food. They could also purchase other household uh, items, including school fees. <clears throat> this access to additional disposable income meant that the households were able to invest more in assets, which helped to connect them to market opportunities and more income generating opportunities. The savings and credit, which was a basic foundation of the program everywhere, was hugely important uh, in terms of helping women uh, either buy land, buy other productive uh, uh, resources that were needed, therefore leading to increased uh, in production. And there was also access to food processing equipment or technologies and labor saving technologies, which were hugely important and resulted in a reduction in women's work burden. If we look at the second outcome around increased income to secure livelihoods, there were several strategies that the program uh, used. The first one was around capacity development and skills development, including issues such as numeracy and literacy and business skills, because if women can't count their money, how can they run businesses? Then there was access to credit, both formal and informal, uh, most of the programs had village savings and loans, the VSLAs, but also others had uh, the RUSACOs, the rural, um, the rural savings uh, cooperatives. <clears throat> uh, the program also led to increase in uh, productive resources, to services, and to other opportunities. Uh, rural women uh, or beneficiaries or participants were linked to local extension services but also to local development uh, planning processes, linkages to larger scale markets, such as the WFP's uh, P4P program, and also linkages to private sector uh, partnership. What we did see as a result of this <clears throat> was that the saving groups were really core to the program, and they emerged as a very powerful transformative uh, element uh, for, for making sure the program could be sustained. The community savings and credit cooperatives 
also enabled uh, Uhuru women with limited access to formal financial services to access credit. Uh, so the VSLAs were very powerful in terms of that. We found out that the savings groups uh, played an important role in enabling women and their families to be more resilient, especially during COVID because they could use the savings to buy food uh, where now they were not able to, to sell their products. They had some access to the credit from the VSLAs. <clears throat> and then what gives these groups real potential for impact and sustainability was the, first, the, the, the combination of access to finance and the organization so that women were organized and they were accessing savings and credit. <clears throat> and as the women groups became more formalized, they were able to access even more opportunities from government services, from other organizations as well. And multiple positive impacts have been uh, documented besides the increase in income. So what we saw was savings, then strengthening the organizational, uh, the organizational capacities, leading to better access to finance, but also collective action, better voice. Women were able to speak up on many issues. And this leads me to the third outcome on enhanced participation in decision-making at household level and community level. Uh, because of the capacity development that was happening within the groups, women reported enhanced self-esteem. The women felt that the self-help groups had really helped them, first of all, to join groups, but also to advocate for their rights, to access better resources, to voice their opinions. Uh, and women felt that they were acquiring social skills through the group that were really improving their leadership capacity, but also enhancing their opportunities. <clears throat> women reported a significant increase in their social skills. They felt that they were able to speak up, they could share, they could train others, they could educate themselves on farming and nutrition, for example. And this greater financial autonomy really facilitated their increased confidence but also allowed them to participate in decision-making within their households. As, uh, as Catherine mentioned, uh, a basic uh, component of the program was using gender transformative approaches. And depending on where, on which country we used, the program used different approaches. So there was a Dimitra listeners clubs, there was a community conversations. Dimitra was in Niger, community conversations, in Ethiopia, and then the global action learning system, the girls was used in, in Kyrgyzstan, in Nepal, um, Kyrgyzstan, in Nepal, and uh, I forget, Guatemala. But, and these were really powerful tools in terms of providing very concrete tools on how to deal with discriminatory social norms. They, they offered a space for discussing and negotiating this difficult, having these difficult conversations but also in engaging with men and with a wider community through a participatory, uh, participatory learning, dialogue, uh, and analyzing gender relations in a space where people didn't feel threatened. And actually, if, when interviewed, even the husbands were reporting social change. So men were saying that they're now taking on increased roles in the households. <clears throat> But then in addition to that, we started to see uh, local level uh, uh, leadership and women really amplifying their voices at community level. So what, what women reported was that being a member in the group meant that it increased their participation and leadership in wider community activities. Women felt that they could participate and voice their concerns in community councils, uh, and also women were participating in local elections and being elected in local councils and other decision-making bodies. So in Ethiopia and Liberia, it was women in land committees and Niger as well in land commissions. In Nepal, they were, they were actually getting elected in ward councils and in Kyrgyzstan, they were being elected in local councils. In terms of the fourth objective, the gender responsive policy environment, what we did find was that depending on the country context and the opportunity, the entry point was different. So in Guatemala, the program supported the Ministry of Agriculture to design the first gender in agriculture policy. 
and we'll continue to support them to improve, to, to implement it. In Liberia, the program supported uh, the Ministry of Gender to, to uh, design the national gender policy, but also worked with the women to really advocate for the Land Rights Act. In Ethiopia, the program formed what was the National Network for Gender Equality in the agriculture sector that brought different stakeholders together to, to discuss issues around gender. In Niger, uh, the program brought two ministries, the Ministry of Gender and Ministry of Agriculture together and actually institutionalized the celebration of International Day of Rural Women, which is celebrated until today. And in Ethiopia, the program uh, supported the government, the agriculture development strategy to implement the gender equality and social inclusion strategy of the agriculture development strategy. What was really important was to make sure that all the work of the, of the program was implemented and integrated within the national systems. And this occurred in different ways. So in Ethiopia, there was a close relationship was built between the program and at least 26 national institutions. In Rwanda, the program was completely aligned with the community structures and the pre-existing service structures of the government. In Guatemala, it ensured uh, that it supported the implementation of the, the, gender equality, uh, the gender equality policy, but also strengthening the capacity of the, of the ministry uh, staff. And in Liberia, the, the program actually helped to coordinate or coordinated with government structures, both at the county and district level. In Niger, it provided training, uh, the, it worked with, within the decentralized structure and ensured that the program really helped to improve access to veterinary services. What did we learn? And a big important component was the importance of partnerships. And these were partnerships between us, the four agencies. I was partnerships between the government and us, but also government and local communities. And really making sure that we are linking governments with beneficiaries, but also civil society organizations. And this synergy developed through the JP Rui partnerships has, prom has prompted new partnerships outside of the ones that we created even partnerships with other civil society organizations and with private sector. So in, this is my last slide and just summarizes some of the, the lessons that we are taking forward in the phase two of the program. The first one is that joint programming, produ of course, produces efficiency gains because you're sharing roles and you're avoiding duplication, but it requires very strong coordination efforts and mechanisms. The second one was that we did not uh, integrate climate resilience as an integral part of the program. And actually three of our countries faced uh, clim climate uh, shock during the program. So we recognize now that it's important to pay attention and integrate climate, uh, climate change and uh, climate resilience right from the beginning, from the design. The second part, the other uh, third element is uh, really paying attention to making sure you have a strong M and E that allows learning across countries and also comparison. <clears throat> the third one, very clear, it came clear to us, is a policy level change takes time. It requires government commitment, it requires stability of government, but it also requires a strong capacity development dimension. So investing in local government ownership definitely contributes to sustainability and policy implementation, but it requires that we are strengthening the government capacity to implement, to implement uh, and to design and implement gender responsive policies. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Susan, very much for that comprehensive overview um, of the program findings. I think we've all got a sense of, um, the size of the program and the fact that you know it's so complex and multi-layered and um, in order to achieve a, a holistic empowerment so thank you for, for being able to capture that in the short time we had thank you susan so we are now going to hear from carla craft who is policy specialist in sustainable development at un women and um, 
Carla was unable to be here in person today to participate in the panel discussion, but she has been able to share with us some policy recommendations from the programme, which we can now hear about. So we are going to share her presentation with you now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Carla Kraft and I am UN Women's Policy Specialist on Sustainable Development at our agency headquarters in New York. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today and it is my sincere pleasure to be able to share with you some important policy dimensions that have contributed to the success of the joint program on accelerating progress towards the economic empowerment of rural women, also known as JPRWE. Dear participants, the results of the Global Learning Plan derived from the phase one of the joint program reconfirm that irreversible progress towards sustainable development requires an enabling in policy environment that guarantees rural women's rights, voice and agency, resilience, livelihoods, and economic empowerment. It is also confirmed that interagency effort around four comprehensive and interdependent strategies can and has resulted in lasting change for rural women. As you've heard, thus far over 80,000 women have been directly impacted by the four outcome areas which include food security, income generation, women's leadership and participation in both production and, and public spaces, and the deliberate promotion of gender responsive rural development policies. In order to enable international, national, and local stakeholders to formulate evidence-based policies that effectively promote rural women's economic empowerment, both within and beyond the context of the JPR we, four policy briefs are being produced aligned with the associated four outcome areas of the joint program. The policy briefs are um, using a few strategies such as leveraging the livid ex experiences of the rural women in the JPRWE countries to recommend policy change that can be tailored to these countries and beyond, as well as translating lessons and best practices from the JPRWE program into comprehensive policy advice and analyzing linkages between key normative instruments and the realized program results to identify appropriate policy solutions. The four topics identified were a result of a collective identification of high policy impact areas through which programmatic interventions advanced rural women's economic empowerment and sustainable development in lively um, in rural areas. These topics include um, the first one, the first policy brief is focusing on making sustainable livelihoods for rural women. Lessons from the Joint Program on Rural Women's Economic Empowerment. The second one probes into why climate resilient agriculture matters for rural women's economic empowerment. The third looks at women in technology in rural areas on strengthening the adoption of both time and labor saving technologies by rural women. And lastly, the fourth looks at making markets work for rural women, lessons from the joint program on rural women's economic empowerment. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start um, giving you a bit of a context about the, the sustainable livelihoods paper. Unfortunately, with our short time together, we won't be able to have a deep dive, but we would like to give you a bit of a taste of the of the policy briefs and what we've been looking at and, and some of the outcomes and recommendations. The sustainable livelihoods paper identifies the interlinkages between socioeconomic well-being and environmental sustainability. In rural areas where women predominate the agricultural sector as a key source of livelihoods, women are often excluded from government and in interventions aimed at promoting sustainable livelihoods. This exclusion, which, me which means limited investment, is made on rural women's capacity to promote sustainable livelihoods, is compounded by high levels of rural women's illiteracy, lack of access to finance, the disproportionate share of unpaid care and domestic work and discriminatory social norms. In Guatemala, for example, the JPR, we identified that rural policies that promote capacity development work best 
for women is when they integrate solutions for addressing gender based discrimination at its core. Such policies need the combination of both supply side solutions like literacy and financial management trainings, as well as the demand side solutions like market linkages and enhancement of rural women opportunities and access to decent work. The paper recommends strengthening rural women's participation in policy decision making at all levels and the redress of unfair competition practices in order to protect small scale rural women producers. The second paper focuses on climate resilient agriculture. Here, the JPRW identifies rural women as potential agents of environmental harmful practices farming practices, agents of positive change, but also beneficiaries of environmental policy in the agricultural sector. These characterizations of rural women farmers frequently interact with their exclusion from climate planning, policy making, and its implementation caused by gender based discrimination in policies and high input prices that make climate smart technologies inaccessible to them. Consequently, climate resilience benefits men more than women, even though women have historically been more involved um, and, and great, greatly involved in both environmental climate action and biodiversity protection. Policies that promote inclusion of rural women in climate resilience are instrumental, not only for climate change adaptation and mitigation, but also to ensure that the benefits from climate resilient agriculture are redistributed more, e more equitably. Furthermore, policies that promote the development of relevant rural infrastructure, like water harvesting plants, such as the case was in Rwanda, one of the implementing countries of the JPRW, and drainage canals, such was the case in Kyrgyzstan, have the potential to promote to protect local natural resources that sustain rural forest ecosystems and biodiversity, while increasing rural women's economic empowerment and advancing gender equality. Finally, women's land rights and tenure security is a cornerstone uh, uh, at the heart of, of the policy work of the JPRW, um, and it's key to the promotion of climate resilient agriculture, one to strengthen rural women's economic empowerment, their autonomy, um, their decision making over sustainable land practices, um, but also as as a collateral for inputs for their next business adventures and um, for their own agency. Uh, one such example of, of the work that can be contributed to efforts of the JPRW was the 2018 Land Rights Act in Liberia that was passed um, also with the inclusion of being a gender responsive policy. The third paper, dear participants, is an in-depth analysis of the role of technology in promoting rural women's economic empowerment. Access to, or lack thereof, technology in rural areas is linked to rural poverty and more directly to women's empowerment. It is premised on the notion that if rural women had the same access to technologies, especially agricultural technologies as men, the gender productivity gap in agriculture could be eliminated. Technology facilitates, among other things, access to information, environmental protection, employment, and the elimination of, of drudgery associated with women's work, both paid and unpaid. Gender inequalities in access to use of and benefit from technology are a consequence of exclusion from its design and dissemination. The JPRW has collected lessons from its program countries such as Niger, where multifunctional platforms have been crucial for reducing the burden of both care, paid and unpaid work. Or in Liberia, where mobile money via digital platforms has allowed rural women to have more control over their finances, in turn strengthening women's economic autonomy and empowerment. The technology paper recommends how um, policy standards for technology uptake in rural areas should integrate both gender and sustainability considerations in technology design if technology is to support rural um, gender responsive rural sustainable development. 
While recognizing the prevalence of market, community level, and household power dynamics, the paper also recommends policies that target the engagement of relevant stakeholders including men and boys, um, private enterprises, and custodians of traditions um, to eliminate stereotypes and exclusionary practices in technology, uh, uptake, use, dissemination, um, and access in, in, in rural areas. The final paper um, looks at rural women's participation in markets, uh, is touted for its potential to increase and, and secure incomes. While promoting a savings culture to, um, for climate resilience or for resilience in times of economic shocks, the, this paper identifies the power of rural women's collectives in negotiating profitable and secure market linkages with suppliers um, of inputs as, as well as buyers. Value chain analysis in the JPR We countries demonstrates causality on women's empowerment of production, efficiency improvements, and environmental sustainability practices, including through the upgrading of traditional economic activities by reducing and redistributing women's conventional uh, gender roles. The markets paper recommends the promotion of policies that seeks to establish and promote gender equal and women led cooperative production and marketing structures, relevant policy reforms and advocacy for formal and informal economies, the latter being more common to rural areas, and the implementation of policies that advance the provision of gender responsive financial services, savings and credit facilities in rural areas. I would like to conclude by reiterating that a comprehensive gender responsive policy agenda um, at the national level is, is therefore advantageous when it recognizes the intersections among these seemingly standalone thematic issues. The, the policy recommendations offered by the JPR, we demonstrate tested approaches and lessons on systematic engagement and, and holistic um, interventions uh, with national authorities, engagement of relevant civic voices to advocate for the promotion of gender responsive rural spaces, and the creation of necessary conditions for rural economies to respond to the specific needs of women. The participating agencies of the JPR we will apply these solutions to the subsequent phase of the program in some of the same as well as new locations that are joining the methodological success of the program. The corresponding knowledge products will be public resources for countries as well as stakeholders, not only direct those directly involved in the JPR we, but ones with significant appetite for gender responsive and sustainable rural development. I very much appreciate your attention and thank you very much. We look forward to you um, reading our policy briefs and, and our further engagement. Thank you very much. Thanks to Carla for sharing these important policy recommendations with us. Um, now, before we go to our next speaker, we would like to share with you just a short video um, from the programme in Guatemala in order to give you a sense of the stories of change experienced by rural women in the programme on the ground. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you will be able to see and hear the video shortly. Uh, okay. Okay. Hopefully, we're good. To Direct descendants of the Mayans, the Quechi people are the largest indigenous group in Guatemala. Predominantly subsistence farmers, they see agriculture as both physical and spiritual, where the act of planting is also an act of creation. For many years, Quechi people have suffered social and political marginalization, and Quechi women face considerable barriers to education, employment, health, and opportunities. Due to inequality, women's plots are small and often located on slopes and degraded soil. They are also excluded from decision-making and community development processes. 
The joint programme on accelerating progress towards the economic empowerment of rural women is supporting indigenous women and their families in Alta Verapaz region in northern Guatemala, helping them to maintain their unique culture while promoting their economic empowerment. <laughs> Ensuring that their culture and traditional knowledge is valued, the joint program provides training on climate smart agricultural practices, adopting traditional techniques, and promoting the nutritional value of native crops. By supporting income generating activities, and setting up over 250 savings groups, women are gaining financial independence, and through education and training, they are participating more in family and community matters. Since 2014, the joint program has supported over 7,000 women and 38,000 family members in Guatemala, empowering indigenous women through transformative social and economic change to help ensure that no one is left behind in the pursuit of gender equality and the realization of the 2030 agenda. I hope you enjoyed um, hearing the stories from Guatemala, um, from the indigenous communities that we have worked with. We are now moving to the second part. Oh, sorry, there's uh, something going on here. Sorry. There we go, sorry, it rolled into the next video. Um, we are now moving to the second part of our session, which will focus on findings from Kyrgyzstan and the behavior change methodologies, which were used to bring about transformative change. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague at IFAD, Beatrice Jerley, Gender, Social Inclusion and Targeting Specialist. Thank you, Beatrice, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I believe there is the recorded presentation that should be starting now. Okay, let me just check with the moderator. Are you able to play the present the pre-recording, please? Here we go. Thank you, Beatrice. Great, thanks. Over to the video. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Beatrice Gerli. I'm a gender targeting and social inclusion specialist working for IFAD, International Fund for Agricultural Development. And today I'm going to present you um, a very interesting experience of the DREAM program, which relates to behavioral change results generated by the use of the gender action learning system in Kyrgyzstan. So before delving into the results, I would like to briefly present you um, uh, about what is what is the gender action learning system. So this is a well-established change methodology that aims at reducing gender inequalities within the household as well as communities, by uh, as well as analyze helping uh, rural men and women to analyze and identify opportunities for improved livelihoods. Uh, and develop a joint livelihood strategies that, that inv involving all household members. So GAUS is the most comprehensive and developed household methodologies and IFAD has been experimenting with it since uh, 2010 in partnership with uh, its author, Linda Mayu, an independent consultant, as well as key partners such as Oxfam and Hebrew. The joint program provided uh, a great avenue um, to adapt uh, uh, GALS uh, to different geographical contexts, uh, such as, for instance, Kyrgyzstan, but also um, Nepal and Guatemala. GALS is a methodology that triggers behavioral change 
and uh, it generates results in terms of uh, better relationships within the household, more equitable uh, decision-making processes, uh, but also better ability to plan livelihoods in general, leading to results such as increased savings, smarter investments, better management of natural resources, or better ability to cope and mitigate negative effects of climate change, and of course, uh, cutting across all of this, uh, improving gender equality and women's empowerment. Dust can also be considered as an accelerator of development interventions. It is actually not a standalone training, but more a delivery method that can suit all types of technical interventions, ranging from value proper value chain development, natural resource management, rural finance, as well as um, climate change adaptation. Another interesting aspect about GALS is that it is based on the use of visual tools, which makes it accessible um, to also illiterate people. That was, wasn't the case of, of Kyrgyzstan, where the literacy rate is very high. But the fact of using uh, visual tools is something that stimulates the right side of the brain, which is the side that relates to creativity, imagination. And that's precisely what helps um, uh, people using DALS to envision a different life for themselves. Uh, to develop a plan uh, to achieve this vision and act on it and also drawing uh, it's not just fun but it also means that you you know what you're talking about if you can draw it means that you're keeping it simple and more achievable bali is an acronym that stands for a business action learning initiative we're going to talk about this methodology too because it is a sequential branch of GALS that was actually invented in Kyrgyzstan in the context of the twin program with the aim to develop business capacity and financial management skills. So basically it requires ability to use GALS, knowledge of its principle, and has the objective to help women to diversify out of the narrow range of what of let's say female activities or activities that are considered to be under female responsibility to enter instead into more profitable businesses or activities that are typically not managed by by women um, this leads typically to the diversification of the livelihood options and also to take advantage of some business opportunities that are available um, in a given community So, um, GALS and Bali uh, were implemented in the joint program in Kyrgyzstan um, with a subset of about 4,000 project beneficiaries. And uh, since uh, we're wrapping up the first phase of the twin program in 2021, a qualitative assessment was conducted to assess the uh, um, the results of the use of this methodology. So in order to conduct the study, we partnered with the University of Central Asia and we interviewed uh, a sample of 271 people that were all beneficiaries of the joint program, but some of them had been using GALS, some others Bali and GALS, and final group did not use either of the two, so that this would help us to understand what are what is the added value of using GALS as opposed to not using it uh, among uh, among within in the context of the project? Um, so we used a variety of methods, uh, community profiles, focus group, uh, in-depth interviews, and so on, and uh, and we interviewed people across the four oblasts, the four regions of implementation of the programs, which are OSH. Narin, um, Jalalabad, and Chui. So the results of this study have been very, very interesting. Uh, the first one that I would like to share with you is the fact that uh, it acted as, we noticed that GALS acted as a development accelerator of results. So participants um, interview of, of, of the study declared that GALS contributed to the revision of all practices on farming and housekeeping, basically helping them to make better use 
of the technical trainings that, that had been provided in the context of the film program. Just to give you some concrete examples, women noted improved practices on crops, on seed plantings, uh, and uh, activities that were optimized to reduce both of the physical burden as well as uh, um, the time workload. Um, also, livestock keeping practices uh, became more productive, and this resulted into an increase uh, of the number of animals uh, owned by uh, the household. Another interesting result was a fairer workload distribution among household members. So Gauss stimulated discussion around uh, um, the allocation of duties and responsibilities between household members, and in particular between female and male household members, leading ultimately to a more balanced distribution of responsibility between family members. And this actually also resulted into um, the ability to free up women's time so that they could also engage in additional um, economic activities, especially those promoted by Bali. But we're going to talk about it later. Another very interesting result of GALS has been the, which is the, the other side of the medal of the fair workload distribution, is improved decision making. Again, GALS has stimulated joint discussion uh, around every kind of household issues involving all family members. So husband, wife, children, but also mother-in-laws that are very powerful decision makers in Kyrgyz households. And this, this um, let's say, um, the occasion to, to, to have this joint, to have joint discussions around what matter to household members was compounded with increased confidence of women to speak up, to bring up their issues and to negotiate their priorities within the household, but also within the communities in um, some cases. Um, I think it's important to um, report also the fact that after the participation in Gals Bali, uh, property uh, discussions also led about questioning uh, property issues, uh, sometimes leading to um, changes in the registration of property, um, which was registered in the name of women, which I think it's quite a remarkable result out of the use of this uh, methodology. Another important finding is the fact uh, that change takes time to happen. So typically when, when using GALS, uh, um, people are stimulated to draw a vision for their life. It's a medium to long-term plan now where, do, where they want to be, who they want to be. And we notice that it takes about one year to start achieving elements of, of that vision. So, um, let's say that an implication uh, of this finding is that monitoring and continuous supporting is key to ensure um, the successful achievement of, of one's vision and to keep the momentum of, of GALS going. Um, in terms of results generated by Bali, the study noted that uh, it had fostered the creative and innovative thinking among users, as well as uh, strategic planning, ability to conduct better problem solving, uh, um, and also taking into consideration gender dimensions when, when doing such planning or when to uh, developing a new business, meaning, for instance, the implication of getting engaged in new business in terms of workloads, in terms of um, allocation of household financial resources, and, and so on. It also helped very concretely to um, have a more detailed analysis of the demands uh, uh, present in, in the market and how to better cater it with the existing resources uh, in a given location or in a given community. So this has led to the development of very innovative businesses based on local supplies and local demand, which therefore hopefully are going to be sustainable over the time. So uh, again, just to give you a few examples, women engaged in the, in the production of the frozen dumplings, uh, um, even targeting export markets. 
Um, they engage in non-standard use of felt and production of various type of felt products. The use of leaves as natural fertilizers, selling them as natural fertilizers, uh, running of bakery, uh, dumpling factory, um, modern and more rational ways of processing vegetables, uh, such as, for instance, fried tomatoes, uh, vegetable salads, uh, um, also led to uh, improved animal husbandry, marketing, uh, advertising, and in a very interesting case, it led uh, to the establishment of a nice skating ring in a very remote community of, uh, of Narin as a business. So, um, Overall, I think that uh, the also and also as demonstrated by the results um, portrayed uh, in the way I values presented by my colleague Anna. Um, I think the use of Bali and Gals Bali have been highly beneficial to, to the results of the green program. However, there are some interesting consideration for, for future programs that should be taken into account also that also emerged out of this qualitative study. The first one relates to uh, issues, to the need to address issues uh, um, that prevent women from actually starting to participate in girls' meeting, which is the need to have on board the support of their husbands or their mother-in-law. So involving also them to understand what this strange growing training is about and what, what, what is the value that they can get out of it. The second consideration is that it's always very important to involve men. Uh, first of all, because GALS is a household methodology, so it does entail um, the need to negotiate uh, priorities and livelihood strategies with other household members. And I think that this general, uh, let's say, call for additional involvement of men applies a bit to uh, our joint program in Kyrgyzstan in, in general as a good lesson learned for the future. Um, then another important finding is that um, monitoring and increasing the frequency of monitoring is very important to keep on providing support uh, to, to people's visions, uh, to people's activities. And lastly, and this is very specific to Bali, uh, it is important to combine the rollout of GALS in Bali with technical trainings of different kinds. And when talking about Bali, we're talking especially about training on financial literacy, marketing, and uh, you know practical and technical uh, business planning, which is favored by Bali tools, but that can uh, anyhow be enhanced by um, better better numeracy and uh, financial literacy. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be waiting for any questions you might have or um points that you wish to be discussing together thank you and over thank you very much Beatrice. um before we go to our final speaker we are just going to share with you our second video clip from kyrgyzstan which helps to illustrate some of the experiences that Beatrice has been sharing with us so i'm just popping this up on the screen Hopefully you'll be able to hear it and see it very shortly. Elettik ayaldar jana kızlar Kırgızstan'da turuqtu özgörünün negizgi agentleri. Tileke karşı çektelegen mümkünçülükler, teknologiyalar, jumuşsuzluk, bilim alu, den soğuluktu qorgu, çeçim qabul alu prosesleri siyahtu göygöylör elettik ayaldar minen kızlardın jolukturgan göygöylörünün bir gana. Mınday göygöylör azıq tülüktün jetişsizliginin, ekonomikalıq krizistin jana klimatın özgörüşünün ta esir qatar gelip çıkkan. Kırgızstan'dağı elettik ayaldardın ekonomikalıq mümkünçülüklerin genetiği birgeleşken programası Birikken Uluttar Oyumunun Dünyalık Azıq Dülük Çana Ayıl Çarba Oyumu. Birikken Uluttar Oyumunun El Aralık Ayıl Çarbası'nın önüktürü fondu. Birikken Uluttar Oyumunun Dünyalık Azıq Dülük Programası. Çana UN Women Oyumdarının Unikaldu Birgeleşken Programası. Bu programa Ceyti Mamlekette Anın İçinde Kırgızstan'da dağı iş kaşıp yadat. 
Бул программанын алкагында АФЭДи алдынкылардан болуп чыгып келе жаткан үйгүлөлүк деңгээлде иш кашырыла турган ГАЛС методологиясы иш кашырылып келди. ГАЛС бул туруктуулукка жетүү үчүн гендердик сезимтал иш аракеттерди аныктоо ыкмалары. ГАЛСтын берген жардамы айкын. ГАЛС процессы катышуучуларынын эркек, аялдар жана алардын балдарынын мүмкүнчүлүктөрүн кеңейтет жана ошону менен бирге өздөрүнүн болгон жана долбоорун сунуштаган мүмкүнчүлүктөрүнүн максималдуу түрдө пайдалуга түрткү берет. ГАЛС процессинде үй бүлөмүчөлөрү чогуу отуруп сүрөт тартуу аркылуу ар кандай ыкмаларды колдону менен жашоо шарттарын жакшыртуу максатында маек, талку, иш аракеттерди пландаштыруу башталат. Бул ыкмалар үй бүлөдөгү жоопкерчиликтердин бөлүштүрүлүшүн анализдеп, теңдөө максатында кайра карап чыгууга, үй бүлөмүчөлөрүнүн бири-бирине карым-катнашын жөнгө салууга да ыңгайлуу шарттарды түзүп берет. Галфа чейин үйдөгү аялдарга гана жасап турган иштердин бардыгын аял заты кылат деп ойлойчумун. Аялдын жумушу жеңил жана көп убакты деле кабылдабайт деп ойлойчумун. Көрсө көрсө аял затынын иши аябай кыйын экен. Бирок биз өзүбүздүн бактуу үй бүлө дарагын тарткандан кийин аялым көрсө көп бааланбаган ишти жалгыз жасап тургандыгын Жана ага эртеден кечке у бактысын кетиреерин сездим. Ошону карап отуруп, мен үй бүлө менен чогуп отуруп, ушул өзгөтөйн ушундай бир сунуштар киргизейин деп ойлодум. Бул жаланган аялдын милдети деген кээ бир милдеттерди мойнума алдым. Мисалы, нанды нанды аялдын көз чогуп биширабыз. Бизде нан жакка мезгилдеп тандырга отун жакканды уят деп сезсеңиз. Мен да ошон ойлочумун. Бирок андан тышкары кээ бир икилерди да шоого жөөбүз. Мен суу ташып берем, суу жылытып берем. Мен Бекажева Бурабе 2015-жылдан бери өжүтүнүн мүчөсүмүн. Азыркы күндө Галстын жана Долбордун жардамы менен бизде 3 саам мал 3-4 погуз, 7 коюбуз, ондой индук тоокторубуз бар. Бунун баары долбордун окутуланынан кийин чыккан каржы жардамы менен келди. Өзгөчө өзгөрүүлөр Галстын жардамы менен күчөйө баштады. Мен байкасам мурда тапкан каражаттарымдын көбүн пайдасы жакка жумшап чекем. Жада калса зыян калып кетүү нерселерге көп жумшап чекем. Мурда күндө 2 пачка тамек чексем, азыр бир пачка түшүп калдым. Акырындык менен тамек чегүүнү такырыла таштап коем деп чечтим. Андан көрө акчаны пайдалуу кесебе жумшайм. Балдарыма билим берүүгө, чакан бизнес ташууга. Мен дагы бир адамды билем, ал галстан кийин ара күчүмдө токтотуп койду. Эки үй бүлөнүн турмушунун жакшырылышы галс процессинин натыйжаларынын мисалдарын көрсөтүп турат. Үй бүлө мүчөлөрүнүн ортосундагы карым-катнаштын адам укуктарын сыйлоо багытына карай оңолушу өзгөчө аялдардын укуктарын жана мүмкүнчүлүктөрүн кеңейтүүдө. Чогуу биргелешип чечим кабыл алуу жана иш мердүүлүктү алып баруу, үй бүлөдөгү гармониянын пайда болушу, каражаттарды үнөмдүү сарптоо, үй бүлөнүн киришесин жогорулатуу жана башка ушундай сыяктуу. Бакыт сенин жанында. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I think it was really great to see men featuring so centrally um, in, in the program in Kyrgyzstan. So I'm now going to pass to our final speaker. Um, if you have any questions, please do feel to write them in the chat as we will have a short Q&A following the last presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Anna Cecilia Rosso who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Economics, Management and Quantitative Methods at the University of Milan um, and worked with us on um, the Women's Empowerment and Agricultural Index M-Line that was carried out in the country. So over to you, Anna, thank you. So thank you very much. I'm gonna share my slides. I hope you can see them. Uh, so uh, this, thank you for, um, for everyone to uh, participate and be in the audience. 
I'm happy to take any questions after the presentation. Um, so this last part of the session will look at the quantitative impact of the project in Kyrgyzstan with a specific focus on the gender action learning system, the GALS, as briefly described or in the business action learning for innovation. To, sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, so if it introduced two new household methodologies uh, and uh, in um, in Kyrgyzstan, and the gender action learning system was already was already used before, but the business action learning for innovation was actually introduced for the first time in in Kyrgyzstan. It provides some behavioral change in terms of gender justice, ability to plan livelihood strategies, fair distribution of workload within the households, manage income generating activities, and increase agricultural productivity. And that has been described very. Uh, well before by Beatrice. So the program began in 2015 and finished in 2020. There were 73 villages that were uh, the, across four provinces that, that were chosen as the beneficiaries of the program. The areas of Osh, Jalalabad, Chui and Narin. All villages received some common intervention and only some villages received either the GALS, 22% of the villages, or both the GALS and Bali, 40% of them. There were a total of 2,431 beneficiaries, 97% of which were women. It should be noted, and this is something that we're going to exploit also in the estimation of the effect. Sorry? Yeah. That... Um, the, the program was actually um, given in a different point in time. So, so 1,700 women were treated in 2015, 988 in 2016, and 649 in 2018. In order to assess the impact of the project, of the program, sorry, we uh, administered a survey between January 16 and February 22nd, 2021, across all these uh, areas that were treated. So the timeline of the program, as I said before, there were different points in time in which the different types of programs were introduced, but also different cohorts of individuals were treated. So the first cohort uh, um, was uh, was introduced uh, in uh, of individuals were introduced in 2015 in the provinces of Chui, Narino, Narin, sorry, Osh and Jalalabad, and uh, to this group of individuals, the common program was just. Uh, uh, was just given. In 2016, a new cohort of individuals, the second cohort was introduced, and uh, these individuals were located in the southern part of the region. Of the, air, um, of the country in the provinces of Osh, Jalalabad, and Batken. And a new, the, um, a new part of the program, the GALS program, was actually added to the common intervention. And then a third cohort in uh, 2019 was also introduced. And again, in the southern part of the country, in the provinces of Osh, Jalalabad, and Batken. And uh, again, the, the GALS Valley. Um, methodology was introduced and it was only given to cohort number one. So what survey tool are we going to use to estimate the effect of the, uh, of the program? We use the project level Women Empowerment in Agricultural Index, the pro AIE survey tool that was developed by E3. The pro AIE measures the empowerment through 12 indicators. I will briefly explain what they are in a minute. They are mapped again three domains. So the first domain is the instrumental agency, so it's the power to. The second domain is the intrinsic agency, the power within. And the third domain is the collective agency, the power with. So we investigate the effect of the program using these three dimensions of the empower, empowerment, sorry, that covers the implementation period from 2015 to 2020. So we're going to look at the different cohorts as well. So the um, indicators that creates is the, the 12 indicators are the following. So the um, intrinsic motivation is, is, is made up of four indicators, the autonomy in income. So a person is considered empowered if 
he or she is more driven by his own decision making and less by what other people feel that it's appropriate. Self-efficacy, a person is considered in power if um, he or she believes that he or her capability, they have the capability to reach their goals. Attitudes towards uh, intimate partner violence, where a person is considered power if she believes that the husband is not justifying hitting or beating the spouse. And respect, the fourth one is respect among household members, the person is consider empowered if she feels respected by the other household members and if she or he respects the other household members. Okay, there are all series of questions that are asked during the survey, uh, during the interviews uh, in order to create these indexes. The um, instrumental agency is made up of these other indicators and it's more about the agricultural and productive activities. So in, in productive decision, a person is empowered if he has some decision in the input for his productive activities. Ownership of land of other assets, a person is empowered if he owns some land of one of, of some assets like uh, uh, large livestock, small li livestock, fish pond, or fish equipment of any farming equipment. Access to a decision to financial services. A person is empowered if he has access uh, and um, has, can make some decision about financial services and he knows about the existence of financial services. Control over the use of incomes, if the person is empowered, if he has some sort of control over the use of income, especially in respect to some home consumption. Work balance, a person is empowered if he works, uh, if, if she or he works less than 10.5 hours per day. Visiting important location, and a person is empowered if she can visit some important locations in the, in, in the village, like the market. Or the school, and if he has the if he has the means to uh, to visit them, and then finally the collective agency, which is the power with, is the ability to be part of some groups within the village, but also uh, the ability to be part of some influential groups in the in the village. We're going to use these twelve indexes to estimate the impact of uh, the the program in terms of empowerment. Okay, the ProAI scores is based on a cutoff of 0 0.25. This means that the individual is empowered if he or she's achieved empowerment in at least nine out of 12 of those indexes that I just described, so 75% of the indicators. So the ProAI uh, uh, three dimension score ranges from zero to one and a score closer to one means that the individual is more empowered with respect to uh, the score of zero. In the sample, the index is above 0.60% for women in all the intervention groups and 0.65 for men in the same uh, uh, villages. If we compare these indexes to the one in, of uh, women in the control villages, sorry, if we compare the, the score to the ones of women in the control villages, the score is actually lower for women, 0 0.53 and 0 0.61 for, for men. This is just to give you an idea of how each single indicator sums up to the total, in this case, disempowerment index. So on the left hand side, I report the GALS and BALI disempowerment for women and men. On the right hand side, the, the, the, um, the, disempow the in disempowerment index for uh, uh, women and men in the control villages. So, and this is, uh, um, you can see that the, the, this, this is, uh, what you can notice from here is that the, uh, there are some indices that are still play an important role in, uh, in the total disempowerment. The first one is the autonomy in decision making. In, and this is true across the, both the Gals and Valley villages, but also the control villages. And, uh, but what is important from this slide is the fact that um, if we look at the total disempowerment for women in the, in the Gals and Valley villages, this total disempowerment is actually lower if compared to the total disempowerment for women in the controlled villages. 
What we're gonna do in the empirical analysis is uh, just compare control versus uh, intervention villages. The reason why we cannot really do more than this is because we don't have a baseline survey in the, that was, uh, in, uh, that was run at the beginning of the period. So the only thing we can do is to be, to control for all the observable characteristic of the individuals and try to match individuals based on the information that we have about them. And then estimate the effect of the, uh, um, of the program on the 12 indicators that I mentioned before. So um, we see that, uh, um, so we estimate the outcome variable Y on a, a dummy for whether the individual is either in the intervention or in the uh, control of villages on a set, and we control for a set of uh, um, demographic characteristic uh, as captured by the variable X. So we have a village fixed effect. Effects of the program is strong and positive and is observed across all the different dimensions of the empowerment with girls and body interventions showing the largest effects. And this is actually very important. Um, the largest impacts uh, uh, of common intervention is actually observed on the indicator input and productive decision and ownership of land and other assets. And both uh, these um, the, the, this probability of being powers in this dimension increased by 30% 30, 30 with respect to the probability that is observed in the control group. So it seems that even the common intervention had a positive impact on these two dimensions. Uh, the gas and valley, and when I say that had the largest effect, is that it positively affected empowerment across so almost all the dimensions, all the indicators that I mentioned before. But in particular, he had a larger effect on asset ownership, on work balance, and on the probability of visiting important locations. The overall effect of gas is there, but it's smaller compared to the Gals and Bali, and it's mainly found uh, in uh, um, across the indicators of the instrumental agency. So just to sum it up, so there are the, the, the we estimate the effect of the of two household methodologies, the exi existing methodologies and a new one that was introduced in uh, Kyrgyzstan. And uh, that were implemented to power women, in particular the Gals methodology, the Gals and Bali. Uh, so the results are larger for, uh, we, we find larger effects for women, mainly driven by the girls and valley intervention that affects all the dimensions of the empowerment. The common intervention and the girls mainly affected the instrumental agency. So I leave it here uh, for, for, other, for some questions, if there are any, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Thank you so much, Anna, uh, for that very interesting presentation. Um, we have 10 minutes left, so we are going to go to discussion and questions um, and answers, should we have any. So perhaps if um, people wish to switch to gallery view um, and either raise their hand or write any questions in the chat. I'm just looking at the chat now and we have... Um, one question, which I am going to put to our panel. Um, so finding the question is as follows. Findings from the JPRU support the evidence that holistic bundled approaches are more effective than single solution approaches. But a key barrier to scaling to the benefit of millions and millions of women is the cost. So the first question is, have you calculated the cost per beneficiary? And then the next is, was there anything in the package that did not work as well as hoped that could be dropped from future iterations and any specific combination of elements that you identified as most transformative? So perhaps I will put this question to Beatrice and then Susan, if you wish to add anything further to Beatrice, you can, you can come in. So over to you Beatrice, please with that question. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you very much, Vicky, for posing the question and for breaking the ice on, on the discussion. Um, so I, I briefly um, answered to you via chat, but let me complement what I, what I included there. 
So um, yes, empowerment takes time and, and is expensive. So one of the key conclusions that we came to realize and that was also identified by the independent evaluation was that um, policy engagement is key. It's key for the sustainability, for the scale of the results. And uh, it's something where we should have definitely done more and where we will actually invest more in the second phase of um, the joint program that we're hoping to launch soon. Uh, policy engagement uh, takes multiple forms uh, uh, in the case of um, the joint program. So we had some good experiences in terms of engaging uh, um, with national authorities and thinking about the support that we provided to Guatemala in setting up a gender unit within the Ministry of Agriculture. I'm thinking about Ethiopia, where we implemented through um, through government authorities uh, or Nepal where we had a very strict cooperation uh, at the different government tires so from the national level down to uh, the local level actually uh, supporting the decentralization process that helped during the lifetime of, of the JP Rui. But it's something where we should have done more. We should have definitely done more, build capacities, uh, supported, uh, uh, I don't know, the revision of legal frameworks, policies, and we will be doing more in the next iteration. In terms of packages of interventions uh, that worked or didn't work, uh, uh, I think it's important to underline the fact that uh, each, um, each country built its own joint program based on their specific needs and priorities. So what we had in Kyrgyzstan, which you just heard um, about, uh, was not what we had in uh, Rwanda, Niger, or, um, or Guatemala. So each program was unique, uh, yet contributing to the same, uh, to the same outcomes. Um, so for this reason, I think that each, each country program was in certain sense unique, but if I have to uh, pin down uh, um, elements that consistently prove to be um, determining uh, for promoting empowerment are definitely the use uh, of groups as entry point, either using existing ones, building new ones, strengthening existing ones, uh, Collective empowerment is really uh, collective agency is really a key determinant of empowerment. And uh, just maybe to add something to the analysis that um, Anna just presented, uh, we saw the difference between regions in Kyrgyzstan uh, in terms of use of gals, uh, whereby regions in the south that had a stronger tradition of groups uh, made way better use of gals and Bali as compared to regions in the north like Chui, which were had a much um, you know weaker uh, so social capital in terms of groups. So, so we, we really saw that. Um, then the involvement of men, which I think I also mentioned in my presentation, has been absolutely key in, uh, uh, in ensuring, uh, um, in ensuring uh, the actual empowerment of women in having, having their buy-in, having their support. Um, and, uh, and then also providing uh, immediately an women with an opportunity to use the newly acquired skill. Um, for instance, marketing skill, financial literacy, have the opportunity to use those immediately, have a reason for you know, being told something was, was highly beneficial in, in getting them motivated, in creating momentum and in enabling them to see results um, straight away. I think I'll leave it here and hand it over to Susan, which I'm sure will have a lot to, to compliment on this over. I think you've covered it uh, very, very well, Beatrice. Um, uh, what I would like to say is what we, we learned is this whole idea of working at different levels. So working at the individual level, strengthening the institutions around the woman and at the policy are really important uh, way to work. And, uh, and recognizing that we collaboration with government was extremely important if we want to sustain the process, strengthening their capacities, making sure that the program was embedded within the existing systems was extremely important, but of course, slowed down the process. But this is what's really important because if you want to sustain the process, it's really good to, to work within the, the government infrastructure that, that's already in place. Um, Things that we, I, I think Beatrice has said, things that we should do better next time, the policy engagement, it's actually one of the areas that we have said we will put very specific 
uh, attention to in the next uh, in the next phase. I think issues, as we said, around climate change, which we again didn't take into consideration very well. Um, issues around work burden as well are other areas that I think we we will emphasize further. Um, I and. I guess the other thing to say is as uh, Beatrice, we did not, we could not calculate the cost per beneficiary because they received such different uh, packages across countries. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, Beatrice. Um, does, okay, there is, um, yeah, I think that's all. I'm just checking the chat. I don't think we have um, any more questions and we're actually reaching the end of the session. Um, so the timing is quite good. Um, please remember that you can contact the presenters directly uh, by the meeting hub in the platform if you want to share more comments or have any questions for us after, after this session. And the conference site and all its functions will remain open should you want to message colleagues, network, or check out the poster gallery. Um, in terms of accessing the various documents that we've referenced during our presentation today, I have put my email address in the chat. Um, it's there, uh, catherine.mccarran at wfp.org. So should you wish to receive um, copies of the various um, research documents we've mentioned, I will be more than happy to share them with you. Um, so it just remains for me to very much thank our presenters and panelists today. Um, for, um, for sharing all the findings with us um, and contributing to this discussion. And then most of all, to thank you um, for your attendance. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>